introduce you first. Um, this is the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum Oral History Project. This is Rod Hoffman. I'm Hannah Nordhaus. It's the 2nd of October, 2003, and we're at Rod's house in Wheatridge, Colorado. So, we can begin. Um, why don't you first just tell me a little bit about yourself, where you were born, and where you grew up, and what your parents did, that sort of thing. I was born in uh, Nebraska, Hastings, Nebraska. And uh, th at the time, my dad worked for uh, Gamble Scogmo, which was a small a company that had uh, hardware and the Scogmo side was clothing and he had worked there and uh, moved then to uh, Fremont, Nebraska and uh, worked there for 10 years in the warehouse. Uh, then he decided he wanted a store of his own so uh, we moved it when I was 10 years old to Minden, Nebraska which is South Central and he had a store there and he uh, Ran it till he retired at, I suppose he was close to 78 or so years old. So they ran that store, probably not quite that old, but it uh, put the kids through college and gave them a little to travel on. So it was a pretty good, uh, pretty good deal for them. Okay. And um, uh, so tell me how you became a classifier. How did you end up in this well, what, what happened was um, I was, I'd gone to college in uh, Indiana and in Florida, and I was uh, visiting a friend of mine in, in uh, Michigan, and just spending a weekend up there with, with a friend, an old college uh, roommate or mate. And uh, he asked me if I want, was interested in working for Dow Chemical. And I s said, well, I hadn't thought much about Dow, but he thought my skills and might fit somewhere into the company. So he had a friend who was in charge of the hiring process. And so Dale uh, asked me if I wanted to talk to him. Well, it was a weekend. It was a Saturday. So he said, this, this guy will come out and talk to you, good friend of mine, not a, not a big deal to get him down to the office. So I went down and talked to him for about an hour. And he said, well, we can't use you here in Midland, Michigan, but I'm going to send your resume, your resume and uh, the interview notes to uh, Colorado. There's a place there near Denver, Rocky Flats. And he said, I believe they might be able to use you. Well, by the time I got home, and I had driven from Nebraska to Michigan, by the time I got home, I had a telegraph from from Rocky Flats asking if I could come and interview. Uh, I believe this was in uh, March and uh, so I came out to Denver and interviewed and got a job offer in, uh, in um, I believe April and then by May I had my clearance which by today's standards is really fast because now it can take many, many months to get a clearance. But in those days, it, the clearance process was fairly fast. Then I went to work at uh, Rocky Flats on um, August 19th, 1963. And I was hired into a department that was uh, called the instrument shop. The, there was a lot of instrumentation that was needed in the processes we had that wasn't available commercially. So this instrument shop was supposed to develop um, instrumentation for uh, various processes and measurements. And uh, so I, I worked there for a couple of years. I, I don't think I was a very good instrument engineer, frankly, but uh, it was a good group of people. And uh, it was a lot of fun working in the instrument shop in old uh, 334 building. What was your degree in that you became an instrument engineer? D Degree was uh, I had a in I went to a little church school in Indiana Taylor University and I had a degree in mathematics uh, and uh, chem and chemistry minor and then I get, got a degree in physics from Florida State University in Tallahassee Florida. Hmm. So you were helping to um, calibrate the instruments. Well, uh, the d actually develop the instrumentation. The calibrations of instruments. Uh, was done by a group, by a um, 
a group in the same organization, the Standards Lab, did calibration that sort of thing, and we worked with them. But the instrumentation and um, measurement devices, uh, some of them were standard off the shelf that we adapted to whatever we needed. But a lot of the uh, a lot of the needed uh, equipment hadn't been developed, and so that was that was the job of this group to to uh, develop that uh, instrumentation. So were you inventing them, or did someone say, we need this, and it needs to look like this, and you had to make sure that it... Basically, they said, we need to measure something. And so we were supposed to come up with methods to measure whatever needed to be measured. They never told us uh, what the equipment should look like or anything like that. They just said, I need to measure this flow rate, or I need to measure this part. And so what instrumentation are you going to develop to to do that? Okay. Um, let me ask you a question. What, tell me what, ca what calibration is. <laughs> okay, well, what calibration, if, if you ha are making a part that has certain tolerances on it, mm -hmm. you have to guarantee to the customer that you have made this part to the standard that they have set. Mm -hmm. And so the instrumentation had to be um, qualified and certified that when you made a measurement on it, it was correct to within a certain tolerance. Mm -hmm. And and that's what the standard lab did. It It was a secondary standards lab and uh, the equipment they've got is phenomenally accurate and so if, if you've got a if you've got a part that's uh, you measure to a, a thousandth um, or something like that the equipment to measure it has to be a lot better than that to guarantee to the customer that this part is what we say it is Um, now, when you came to Rocky Flats, when you were first given the opportunity to interview at Rocky Flats, did you have any idea what it was or what, what was done there? I had no idea. Uh, I knew it was a place that had a lot of uh, um, secrecy, uh, but I didn't even interview at the plant. There was a, there was a uh, building on 41st and Wadsworth on the southwest corner. I think it was a medical something building and, and that's where the Dow offices were that did the the hiring and, and personnel kinds of work. So, so that's where I actually interviewed was there at 41st and Wadsworth. And when did you figure out what they made? Well at, at, the, at the time that I hired in it was still fairly well compartmentalized in that uh, if you were working in a building that had chemistry, chem chemical processing, if you were developing um, instrumentation for measuring something there, you, you didn't necessarily have the need to know to go into the building where they were manufacturing parts for weapons. Mm -hmm. And so in those days you had the clearance to be able to do uh, whatever job needed to be done. You had a high enough clearance level. But uh, the, the buildings were, um, the, the various kinds of things that were done with different materials uh, were separated. And you didn't necessarily just go into all those buildings. Now, if you, if you had a project that you were asked to work on in any of the buildings, you could certainly go in to any building you needed to to, to develop processes, find out what they needed. Mm -hmm. But but uh, at one time before I went out, all of the buildings were little fiefdoms, and uh, they had a manager, and he was like the czar, mm -hmm. and didn't want other people coming in this building. Uh, it it had opened up a lot by the time I got there, but but when I got there, need to know was still pretty important. And uh, as I said, I could do my job, whatever I needed to do my job, I could. But they didn't just open it up and say, well, here's what we do here, and 
and show the uh, a list of uh, everything we did in pictures and all that. They just didn't do that, and and didn't do that clear up to the end. Um, a, a need to know, along with the proper clearance, was it was and is is still important. Mm -hmm. So, what did you know then? Well, then I didn't know much of anything. <laughs> um, all college does for you in in some businesses, and, and it turned out for me, uh, not so true for other kinds of things, but, but it turned out for me that all college does is give you some basic background and how to think and, and, uh, uh, and, and certainly uh, uh, more than that, but you, you, you find out, and I suspect a lot of people have the same uh, experience, that you find out that what you really end up doing doesn't bear a heck of a lot of relationship to what you studied. I, I featured myself, I got a degree in physics, I featured myself doing some kinds of measurements or working with uh, materials uh, and uh, finding out more about atoms and how they work and electrons and neutrons and all that uh, when I was in college. And uh, that really, for understanding a lot of things, is important, but, but that isn't really what I did. But it was, it's, it's been a fun experience. I've, I've been out there 40 years now, so I've seen a lot of changes. That you have. So, okay, so you were in for, for two years, were in the instruments. Correct, yes. Uh, and then what happened? Well, then. Uh, as I said before, I don't think I was very good at that. And uh, a, an opportunity came up to go into product engineering. And there are several parts of product engineering. There was, depending on which lab you worked for, whether you with, worked with, I should say, Livermore or Los Alamos or even Sandia or even other projects uh, for, for weapon production, but I was fortunate enough to get into the part that, that had de the development, um, um, we, d we, we were developing uh, weapons that probably, yes, developing weapons, but they were at a very early stage. So the military had asked for a certain specification for a certain weapon, and so the two uh, the two design labs that that dealt with the nuclear package, and that is Livermore, uh, Lawrence Livermore, and Los Alamos, they would compete actually compete on. Okay, we propose that for this particular system, we propose this nuclear package, and so. It, the, the part I was in was fun because then we got to take at a fairly early design stage and we, we were responsible for building uh, parts that would go into the weapon and then we would take ours, put them on a, put them on a uh, truck, send everything out to the test site and they would test it, downhole test. Uh, to, to find out what the results of their, uh, of their design uh, were. And there were all, all sorts of things that were involved on, and, and, and the labs would actually compete to get uh, the new uh, Minuteman or the new uh, Trident uh, design. And so the parts that you, what, what sort of parts were you, I mean, would you guys put together the whole no, package or just the, the triggers? Base, basically, we were making what we call pits. And, uh, and we also, oh, what we called uh, boost containers. Uh, so we were um, responsible for um, taking, we took the, um, the, the basic design from the, from the lab and uh, then we had people in uh, our drawing group that um, 
reduce those to uh, items that could actually be made. Because a lot of times when they came in, the, the design wasn't very useful as far as the manufacturing process. So we had a group out there, um, product definition, that took that, made um, sheets and drawings that could be actually manufactured. And, and at that point, then we uh, got everybody together and said, we need to make this thing, and we've got a schedule of this, and how much is it going to cost, and all of that. And, and uh, so then we went through the process of making the parts, putting the parts together. This is for a pit. Mm -hmm. We would make the parts, put the parts together, do all the welding and brazing and all of that sort of thing that needed to be done, and uh, then take the final product and uh, put it put it aboard, uh, give it to a courier, mm -hmm. who would uh, uh, take it to the test site. We also did did other things that had to do with um, parts that weren't that didn't have live materials in them, so they could see how the process went, and they could do various various tests. You would do, you wouldn't have to have plutonium or uh, or or uranium in them, or or at least enriched uranium, and so you'd you'd make some that were uh, that were never intended to be uh, sent to the test site, but they'd do uh, experiments with them at the labs. Okay. And so, how long did you do that for? I did that until 1973, so about I guess about eight years, and. Uh, then I decided uh, that I would uh, apply for a job in in the classification office. There was one advertised, um, and so I didn't. I I knew just enough about classification to kind of be dangerous, mm -hmm. and um, but it seemed like a good opportunity, and it was a it was a good level of job, and, and so I applied for the job. And the experience I'd had, I'd had a lot of weapons experience, made that job a lot easier because I understood a lot of how weapons, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of how weapons work. Uh, um, and so in classification office, in order to make sound decision, it's, it's important to know something about how they work. So I. I applied for that job, and I was a classification analyst, worked for the classification officer for a couple of years uh, until 70, I believe it was late 75, and then uh, Dow Chemical left in 75, and Rockwell International came in. And so uh, I, I probably in 76, um, Rockwell, uh, uh, needed a classification officer, and so I was appointed by um, headquarters, by the Office of Classification DOE in, in uh, Germantown, Maryland. I was appointed the classification officer for the contractor, which was Rockwell International, and basically did that until 92, and EG&G had come in 89, and I was classification officer for, for EG&G then until um, September of uh, 92, and then at that point, the, uh, the classification office in the DOE uh, uh, part of, the op of Rocky Flats, uh, Rocky Flats office, um, was they had a person that was a classification contact, but not strong in in the discipline, and so they had gotten criticism uh, for their program and not providing proper oversight to the contractor, and so uh, they uh, offered me a job then in the um, Rocky Flats field office, RFFO, and uh, I'm still there. So you never. Actually retired, retired. Well, no, I I I, I retired in uh, with the benefits from the contractor, medical benefits, and 
and my uh, pension and then went to work immediately and well I, I was two days without a job except that they needed someone to sit in and monitor some meetings and so I did that for free for a couple of days. So what made you decide to apply for the classification job in the first place? It was, I was getting to where one, one thing about the special order shop, which I was in, and that can be really hectic. If, if you've got a test going on and you have any kind of delay, you don't let anything stand in your way of, of getting it done. Uh, I sometimes would go to work and not show up at home for days. You'd sleep on desks and uh, you got to know all the nurses up in the infirmary and a lot of times you could about, you could say, well, okay, we've, we've got no action now for the next couple hours. And you could catch a car up there, a guard would take you up there and you'd sleep for a couple hours and the nurses would say, okay, when do you have to be back down there? And so they'd wake you when you, uh, or you'd sleep on desks. Uh, that kind of thing, but I literally sometimes was out there without coming home for a week, and and it it got to it it was rewarding, <clears throat> and and normally uh, when you'd get one of these jobs finished, uh, you had a little time to kind of sit back and relax, but uh, it just seemed like it was a time to change. And what interested you about? Well, you, you kind of, in classification, you kind of get the big picture. You get, you get a look at the whole plant. You probably, as a classifier, you get a better look at, at all of the activities that go on and what, and, and what it takes to um, six, have a successful uh, uh, manufacturing production process. You, you, you get the best look from classification office because <clears throat> we, we had to review every activity that was going on mm -hmm. out at the plant. And um, even, even activities that aren't classified because some of them, it, turn, <clears throat> it turns out that certainly now some of the unclassified activities are still sensitive activities. And what, what sensitive might mean is that, uh, is there an unclassified process or that would um, give uh, your enemy uh, information that would help them develop a program? And, and so you looked at all of these kinds of programs and, and, um, and it was uh, interesting and I think rewarding to be able to do some of these kinds of things. Uh, and, and you always have a tough balance because the public has a right to know. And the public is paying for this. And so, you know, they have a right to know certain things. And if we, if a process is developed out there that's useful to the public, if it isn't classified, it needs to be put out so that people can use it. Mm -hmm. And and so, um, you, you, you have to um, you have to be real careful of the public rights because they do have rights and and a lot of times uh, the, uh, you're accused sometimes of well you're classifying this just because you want to hide something and uh, I, I suspect that there are government entities that have done that, but DOE has always been big on don't don't try to hide stuff because just because you don't want it out or just because somebody goofed up and uh, you don't want them to find out that you did or something like that. Uh, that's a that's not a reason for not releasing something. At one time, there were <clears throat> about 150. And were you, <clears throat> you 
assigning specific <coughs> processes or departments or how? what what you like to do is uh, there are certain departments that develop that uh, uh, have a lot more uh, sensitive or classified information mm -hmm. and what you like to, what you hope that you can do is in those departments you can get quite a few classifiers so that because these the classifiers that we have that we train and have they got real jobs <laughs> and and so they don't want their classification activities <clears throat> to take away from what their real job is but on the other hand they want to to make sure that the information that needs to be protected is protected and so you need quite a few classifiers to make sure that somebody sitting there doesn't spend his whole day classifying and reviewing documents rather than uh, developing whatever process he needs to or doing whatever whatever job he needs to do. So there are classifiers who are <clears throat> in the departments and are um, doing their jobs in the departments and then their side job is classifiers. Correct. Correct. And then there's full-time classifiers as well. And there are full-time classifiers in the classification office and I guess we've had up to probably five or six full-time classifiers in the, don't quote me on that number, but, but something like that. You would have several uh, that, would, that would be in the classification office and that's their job is classification. Mm -hmm. And so are they overseeing the other classifiers or are they doing all that sort of? They would, they would, um, the ones in the classification office are doing several things. They're, the, <clears throat> you do, guidance is developed by headquarters, as to for, and headquarters says certain things are classified. And so they send this information to us in what they call classification guides. Well, it's, it's, by nature has to be fairly general because they don't know the nits and grits exactly of what we do. So we take the headquarters guidance and we try to reduce it to something that is a almost a cookbook. If a classifier in the field is asked a question, he doesn't want to sit and philosophize and, and about, about a process. He wants to go and find an answer. He or she, in fact, many of our classifiers are women. And so we try to, to make our guidance so that they don't have to worry about it. If they had a headquarters guide, they would probably have to do quite a bit of research to find out what they needed to classify and what they didn't. So we in the classification office um, had our own guides and guidance that we sent out and so the classifiers had these in their safe, so they could open their safe, look up the particular problem. And, and we got it down to really tiny, tiny things. Uh, the fact of something and if it's classified or not. And so we tried to address it very, very specifically, which the headquarters guidance didn't do. So, <coughs> so what I'm saying is <coughs> that we had people in the classification office whose primary job was to develop this guidance. And so they were doing that. Uh, we had people in the classification office who were working on specific um, problems. We had, we had the, peop the people in the classification office basically were open to people would come in and ask questions, classifiers in the, or people who had a document that they wanted reviewed would bring it in. And, and all, the, all of the classifiers in the classification office would develop a clientele. It, it worked out that way. Somebody's comfortable with working with one person and so they almost always came in and talked to the same person. And, and, uh, and so, we, we had plenty to do with developing guidance and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of things you'd work on, there really wasn't any guidance developed. So we started kind of with an idea 
and uh, a, maybe a concept and, uh, and, and, and developed it. So the guidance was the basis of classification that if this information was made public, it could help someone else create the same weapon? Yes, the, the Atomic Energy Act of, uh, I, what is it, 1948, or as amended in 1954, uh, was the basis for the classification of weapon data, restricted data. And it, it turns out that weapon data is classified from birth, which means that as soon as any of it's developed, it's classified. Mm -hmm. The only way to get it out of the classified arena was to uh, make a, a um, inquiry or um, uh, research into the situation because certain areas had been declassified. And so is this an area that's been declassified? If it's not, if there's no declassification action, it is classified, having to do with weapon data, and they call that restricted data. And, and that is information that has to do with the design and use of nuclear weapons and processing of materials and those kinds of things. So, um, that is as opposed to other classified information that's in, in and this is, this is a law, the, the, the act, the Atomic Energy Act. There are executive orders that are put out by the president that talk about classification of other than nuclear weapons, and that's called national security information. And that's on an executive order. That information is not classified by law. An analysis has to be made. We say, okay, well, this information on this alarm system would aid a bad guy coming in to defeat our alarm system. So we classify it. Mm -hmm. And you classify, uh, uh, it has to do with security kinds of things and the security kinds of things that actually protect what you're doing in the in the uh, development of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So there are two kinds of classification. One, the nuclear weapon classification, and everything else is under the NSI or national security information. So were you mostly doing the, under the atomic energy? At, we, were, we were about 98% doing restricted data, but that's not, over the last five or six or even 10 years, we did a lot of classification on, on the NSI, National Security Information. Why is that, why is that changed? It's changed for us because of the fact that in, uh, over the last 13 or 14 years, we've done very little in the area of, well, we haven't, well, very little, I should say, in the area of uh, weapon manufacture. Mm -hmm. uh, since 1989, We've done nothing in the manufacture of pits or triggers, whatever you want to call them. And we did do um, non-nuclear work that had to do with pieces and parts for nuclear weapons up, at, up until, gosh, I can't remember, 80, 80, uh, 95, mm -hmm. something like that, 94 or 5, I don't remember. At, uh, but there were still, um, a lot of uh, um, classification decisions that had to be made on alarm system, on security systems, on uh, guard exercises, uh, some kinds of things that have gotten more sophisticated over the last uh, um, 10 or 12 years. Basic, basically, 30 or 40 years ago, you just kept everybody out. Right. And, and so the alarm uh, systems, a lot, a lot of what went on there was uh, not exposed. Mm -hmm. And 
and as uh, openness has happened, there, there are just a lot more issues now that you have to deal with as far as um, national security information. Um, so, you, as a classifier, what are you reviewing? Like, at the end of a day's work, do people submit docu whatever they've produced to be classified, or is it as something arises and and what does it actually mean when it becomes classified? If they can't mention it, no one can see it. Well, you you do both. Um, people write reports. And uh, if there, there are certain areas that there, it's very likely that they're going to have classified information if they write about certain kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And so the author of the report is required to um, protect that information uh, as classified until a, a classifier can review it and say yes or no. Mm -hmm. and, and so if, if you there, there are certain areas that we designate that we say there's no possibility that you get any classified information in this area. So um, exemption letters are written to people saying, okay, you're working on something and you don't have to have it reviewed because we'll give you this letter that says you have no possibility of having classified information. But um, problems arise or issues, I should say, arise um, all the time. That, that somebody will walk into the office and say, okay, we've got this situation. Uh, can we have uh, uh, some help on getting this reviewed properly? And then uh, people that do reports, then there was a process for, for uh, reports. Reports got written. They got reviewed. They got entered into a, uh, a national um, um, repository for, for classified and unclassified reports, and all of these had to be had to get a had technical review and a classification review. Um, and so, in terms of what people could talk about, what how they just were there certain things when they came to work? You said you just can't mention this, this, that. Did you, you must have had to train them. Well, when, when I first came to work out there, and for many years after that, there were uh, married people who wives or husbands knew only that they worked at Rocky Flats. Very, very closed mouth. You didn't talk, you, didn't t you never talked about your job. Mm -hmm. You went home and talked about other things, but uh, up until recently, you just never talked about your job. Uh, it was easier not to. Uh, my wife didn't know what I did for for years and years and years. She just knew I worked out here. And now that she works out there, she knows a lot more. But but you can talk, and people do talk about their jobs and what kinds of things they do. They're welders and they're machinists and they're uh, researchers and all those kinds of things. And people do, in fact. Uh, there are certain areas you shouldn't talk about, of course. Mm -hmm. But up until recently, you just didn't talk. And hardly, I think, I think if you interview people that have been out there a long time, you'll find that you just didn't, you never talked about your job. Yeah. So it, it's changed a lot. And do you give people training about what they can and can't talk about now? Or that it's Everybody gets, re, gets a review a security review and they talk and, and in that we don't do that so much as the security folks do and when you come to work out there you get a you get a a briefing as to what the rules are and what uh, what what your responsibilities are as far as protecting information now when when we train the classifiers um, and we probably won't be training anymore now because you know we're only a couple of years from, from shutdown. Uh, we take them through a whole um, two weeks of of uh, how nuclear weapons work, what's classified about them. Um, uh, it's very very technical, mm -hmm. and. Uh, 
so so they they know when they get out of our class uh, what the limits are pretty well and and we we ask for de technical degrees for class buyers um, we we like work experience in uh, in weapons those kinds of things you don't always get all of that and uh, I've had t two two of the classifiers I've helped trained are women who came in as uh, administrative who didn't have degrees but they worked darn hard to understand what was going on and spent a lot of time uh, so it's it's not a thing that uh, locks you out necessarily but it's a heck of a lot easier if you've got a technical background and have been actually in the manufacturing process because these ladies I mean they're fortunately they were very sharp ladies and they got to be authorized classifiers but they they worked their they worked their little tails off so, so did, did people did uh, new employees have to take a test or anything to, to prove that they you know like pretend they're at a dinner party or something no no, no. To become a classifier, they have to take tests, but no. Um, so, and, and there are different levels of classification, right? There are different levels. There's, um, basically, there's a top secret, secret, and confidential. And these are, these are the standard ones now. In the in the past, there have been other, some other variations, but but basically, it's secret, top secret and confidential and then there are there are, there's unclassified information that has certain sensitivity and but it's it's not called classified it's called um, con controlled sensitive information it, there could be official use only or there could be unclassified controlled nuclear information which is called UCNI um, and um, there uh, Especially with with national security information, if you've if you if you've got a deal with the state patrol or the local sheriff's department, and you've got some sensitive inf information, uh, these these folks don't have any kind of clearance, and so you've got to be able to share information with with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So if you classify it, they don't have it. Well, what's worse, having them not know anything or having them read into a program that has some sensitivity. And that's one of the things that, that uh, these sensitive, unclassified but sensitive categories help you do. Well, we can share it with the Sheriff's Department because uh, they need to know it, and, but it's not going to be classified. So if something has potential to lose a security risk once it leaves the plan or something about yeah, let's say that um, uh, let's say that there are some uh, operatives in the area that might be trying to uh, get on plant site. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd probably want um, maybe Boulder Sheriff and Jefferson County Sheriff, State Patrol. You'd probably want them to know about that. Your operatives trying to get on the plant. Try, yeah, other countries? bad guys. Yeah. Or, or, or are there bad guys? There, unfortunately, there are bad guys in the world. Were there were bad guys who tried to get on the Rocky Flat site? I don't know of any. There, were, the, the, the famous one was the, the nuns that, uh, yeah. that, that came, and I, I don't think they're bad people. No, I don't think they are. But, but uh, they, uh, they wanted to on one of the fences inside. Uh, they wanted to put a banner up and all that. They. What, what they did was illegal, but I don't think they're bad people. And I don't think, I don't think much happened. I don't, as I recall, they got scolded and that kind of thing and probably uh, got arrested. Well, I know they got arrested, but I don't, I don't think they spent any time in jail. Okay, I, so someone that uh, I just interviewed, Ed Vavoda, oh, yeah. he mentioned to me, he said, you should ask about classification, because he said that 
we had some knew of some instances, or I don't know if it happened all the time or only a couple times, where people would um, produce something or write something, and then it would be classified a higher clearance than they had, so that they could mm -hmm. read what they'd written. Mm -hmm. Well, what what has happened is, uh, like Ed Vavoda might might write a, of course he's still got a Q clearance, but there are a lot of people who have um, who have had a Q clearance and have retired. And we've brought several of these people back to talk about certain processes because the, 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 the new facility that's supposed to manufacture weapons uh, needed to know some information that they might have in their heads. Mm -hmm. And so you, you say, well, okay, you don't have a clearance. Okay, I know you wrote this document, but you can't read it <laughs> because you no longer have a clearance. And it's, it's kind of a technicality but uh, they are they are starting to to um, to say in some circumstances that well uh, you can have information that you have in your head and sometimes they'll even let them look at the classified document that they wrote mm -hmm. to refresh themselves but you don't give them any new information because you really can't wipe out most people's memory banks uh, they, they remember most of what they did with the exception lo a lot of times of some details and sometimes the details are important mm -hmm. so so you want to interview these people and say okay we um, we're gonna let you look at your document and uh, you can talk about it but if it's a different document that somebody else wrote they'll they, we won't let them review it so you need them for the specific project they've come in for, but you don't, you don't go through the whole clearance process. Right. So a Q clearance is cleared to do all, read top secret, secret, and what was the program? It is with need to know. With need to know. Uh, yeah, Q, Q clearance will give you top secret, secret, and confidential. And then what is, are, there, are there a lot of people, are most people on site Q clearance? Or Not Q anymore. At one time, virtually everyone was Q cleared. Uh, but but not anymore. I, I I don't know. People can tell you how many. I don't know how many Q clearances we have, but it's uh, relatively small now. That's security who does the clearances, or is that um, the the clearances are done by an agency. Uh, the the DOE uh, has another agency do background checks, and if if you get put in for a clearance, they look at. You, you basically go back to what you've done all your life and where you went to school and and uh, who, who you knew, where you've traveled. And uh, then every after you get a clearance, then every five years, what did you do in the last five years? So they, they have a five-year update. Um, so what was it like for you to be cleared? And, and just the, what was it like to... Do you have your whole career be under such high security that you couldn't share it with your family? Oh, it was it was interesting. the The clearance was was fat was fast for me, as I said, back in in '63. But um, I got married in '67, and Betty, she never pried to to know what was going on. Um, I don't. I I think most people looked at it. As, a, as an important job, I did. Something that needed to be done. Uh, it's a really good thing sometimes to separate your work from your, from your play. And I suspect that a lot of people that uh, have breakdowns sometimes can't, can't separate those things. So, in in some ways, I th I think it was a good thing mm -hmm. that you couldn't you, you couldn't bring your your job home with you, um, and so I never I never thought it was any kind of a disadvantage. People knew where you lived. Most people were pretty good, you know. Um, you'd say, okay, uh, where do you work? Oh, I work out at Rocky Flats. Oh, what do you do out there? I go, okay, I'm an engineer. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice. 
uh, that, that kind of thing. I, I never did, and I think people did run into people that pried, but I don't think anybody ever, and, and, as, and as, as we've gone along, you've been able to talk more about, about what you did. Um, you know, at one time, the fact that there was a pit manufacturing plant uh, was classified. Uh, so there were there were a lot of things that um, that you, you couldn't talk about anyway. So so why bother? When was that declassified? Pit manufacturing was declassified. Uh, oh golly, um, pro probably in the fifties. It was declassified just because. Everybody knew it. At well, yeah. It, there's they they found out that uh, even though you'd like to do certain things, it, there there are some things that are so blatantly obvious uh, that eventually <clears throat> they just ha there's no point in in putting up the charade any longer. Uh, that doesn't always happen. I mean, there are certain things that. <clears throat> look to us like they're obvious, but they've never declassified them. And, and there are some reasons for that, uh, but, but often on some of those kinds of things, uh, if you're ordering uh, um, some material from some company, you're probably using it. And, and so uh, that they have used uh, well, at, at one time, materials, uh, some materials we used were ordered by a different organization and then send, so you'd send it to uh, Los Alamos or somewhere like that. And then they'd send it to us. And, and they could protect the sending it to us. Mm -hmm. but, but they couldn't protect the fact that they bought this standard steel out of somewhere and sent it to Los Alamos, you know, this, if, and, and that's just an example or to Kansas City or to Ohio, they ordered something and then they'd send it to us because it made certain revelations about what we were doing because we were dealing with that particular material. That was only used in bombs? Yeah, yeah, right. Did you do, do you do any declassifying or is that done in Washington? Oh yes, we, we, um, we do quite a bit of declassifying. Um, there's a process you go through to become a declassifier. And in fact, uh, Ed Vavoda is a declassifier too. And uh, there, we've got eight or ten declassifiers, ten or twelve. And you you have to go to a special uh, school to do that, but at DOE school, and then uh, take a take a test, and then you can become a declassifier. And uh, we we declassify actually quite a bit of information. More and more, in fact, there's a, there are uh, organizations in uh, Germantown, Maryland, that there is a, a part of what used to be the classification office that spends uh, thousands of hours declassifying documents. Is it harder to become a declassifier or a classifier? It's, uh, it's harder in that... Um, there's there's a strange thing. You don't have to be a classifier to become a declassifier, which to me makes no, not much sense, because these the information you have to know is exactly the same. And and so it, it's just one of those strange quirks that happens. But but basically, um, the declass the declassifier training is a learning how to, um, it's, it's a mechanical thing. What do you have to do to take this information? How do you take this information? Um, one of the things you might do is, if you're declass, if the only thing in a paragraph that is classified is one word, if you take that one word out, or a number you take out, let's say, um, you might have to take words on each side of it out because often you find out in declassification what you take out is so evident 
it's just absolutely clear mm -hmm. what you took out. So, de so some of the declassification um, process, uh, you have to be real careful. Uh, I remember we were declassifying a document and it had um, in a table of contents. It had maybe every uh, uh, different uh, chapter, it had paragraphs in there that came in a logical order. Mm -hmm. And so you'd take out the one that was classified. Well, it was clear what that one was right. because you'd covered everything else. And so uh, de declassification is, um, um, it goes beyond just taking out the word that's, because there's, there's implication in there all the time. And so it was, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting. We, we had one large document that, that was of interest and several of us worked on it. And uh, somebody went through it, somebody else went through it, I went through it, somebody else from me went through it, sent it to headquarters, they went through it. And, and it was, you just found all sorts of interesting stuff about, about how you could uh, mess up on a document like that. It was, it was interesting. Huh. Okay, um, well, why don't we just, um, I just want to warn you, probably in about five minutes I'm going to give you away, which means the tape's going to run out. We need to change tapes. Okay. So, um, trying to think of uh, questions I can ask in five minutes that won't get you going for longer. Um, why don't you tell me what, um, the differences between the different contractors to work for, or what was your job the same under all of them, or what was the atmosphere like and stuff? Okay, well, Dow, uh, Dow was a very patriotic <clears throat> company, and they, um, Dow was a, a family company, and I think the way it was, the way it was uh, um, established and they wanted, they wanted people in their families to take part in the off-work activities that you did. And Dow was also a uh, very safety-minded company. Mm -hmm. And some stories you hear now about people getting exposed and stuff like that, we can, we can, we can cover later because, you know, 2020 hindsight is wonderful. But, but Dow is a very, very patriotic company and, and a very family-oriented uh, company. And they, they would divide the plant into teams and uh, the product engineering might be teamed with the maintenance guys. Mm -hmm. And quality might be teamed with uh, purchasing. And what these teams did was they, they tried to make them approximately the same size. And these teams would, uh, the goal is to have no lost time injury. And so if the team in a certain number of months had not had a lost time injury, the company threw a party down at the aviation club down on Teller and 17th and Teller or something like that. And they pay for the whole thing. Management was expected to show up, and did. Upper, upper management was expected to be there. And, and they threw usually a steak dinner, and, and they covered the, the cost of the, and then there was a dance afterwards. They also had safety awards. My two favorite fishing poles I got on safety, and award, safety awards. Uh, and, and they had some really kind of neat stuff. And, and so Dow did all those sorts of things and wanted people involved and gave Dow products and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Rockwell was a pretty good company too. And they, um, they came in, they, had, they also had, uh, they, they had a company sh uh, store mm -hmm. that you could go in and, and, and purchase things for a pretty reasonable price, uh, the, the safety, teams. Safety was still important, but they didn't have the teams and the dinner dances and all of that sort of thing. But they, um, they were 
Uh, Dow was not in for the profit. They were trying to be patriotic and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and things have changed through the year for that. The companies that are doing now are, are in for a profit. Uh, Rockwell was in for some for, for a profit, but uh, uh, Rockwell is also a, a kind of a patriotic company, and they were um, uh, the management changed, but the people didn't change very much mm -hmm. with Rockwell and Dow, and and then in and then E G and G came in uh, in 1989 after the famous raid. And um, EG&G was not a company that was equipped or prepared or competent to run a plant like that. They were a very competent company in what they did, and what they did in instrumentation and some of those things was wonderful. I mean, as good as anybody ever did. <clears throat> but it was not a, it was, it, they, they didn't know production. They didn't know those kinds of things. Um, and and um, the, the, I I think E G and G, I'm I'm I would never badmouth them because I think they're a good company. But I think they were in over their head, probably. And then Kaiser Hill came along in what ninety ninety five. And uh, when Kaiser Hill got there, everything had changed. Mm -hmm. They're uh, in there, basically shut the place down. So they didn't have to know um, about manufacturing processes and all of those, and you know, it wasn't very important for them to know that. Uh, but they they certainly were uh, were in it for a, for a, for a nice profit, yeah. and so, and so they've uh, uh, they've continued to be there, and as you probably know, they're going to be there until the next couple of years when we really get it shut down. But 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 they're different. The companies are all totally different, and uh, it was it was more fun back under Dow and then and and Rockwell. Um, um, I, th I think I think they were more more people mm -hmm. companies than than later on. Um, all the companies that are that have run it have made mistakes. And Let me stop you. Um, so um, I was going to skip down to the safety and security issues since we just discussed um, that a little bit with the contractors. But um, let me just ask you this question: uh, The public has a sense that Rocky Flats is a very dangerous place to work. Did you feel this was so? And did your perception of the safety issues change over time as you worked there? Well, I heard. Um, I, th I think if I think if you interview a lot of the people that have been there a while, um, I've heard more people say that it was the safest place to work that I ever worked, and and I believe that. I don't think and people were watching out for each other. Uh, I remember uh, if you'd walk out in one of the uh, production areas. And didn't have your safety glasses. Within about five steps, somebody'd tap you on the shoulder and say, well, "Where are your safety glasses?" Oh, okay. Well, I forgot them in the office. Well, go back and get them. Or did you bring your respirator? Uh, or or whatever. You shouldn't be uh, leaning up against that equipment because there could be some residual uh, radio radioactive material on it or something like that. People were always just telling. Telling their uh, uh, workers, their fellow workers, uh, just just be careful, and that was that was a big deal. And 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 Dow's uh, safety dinner dances. It was about safety and uh, uh, work safe, uh, and you'll be safe. Life. They had a Dow had a slogan: "Life is fragile, handle with care." And they. They had stickers that they're probably still. I, I know there's still some out there that are stuck on on some equipment. They were a peel off thing. Uh, very very concerned about safety. Now there there are probably some areas we didn't know enough about, and one of them probably was beryllium. 
and, and uh, th th when people ask now, well, people got exposed to beryllium back there. Why did you ever let that happen? Well, there were there were standards then, and I think th I think, th and I'm no expert on on health issues, but I think that uh, th it turns out that the standards probably weren't totally correct. And, and so now we can look back and say, well, we shouldn't have done that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think anybody was exposed uh, knowingly to, uh, to hazards. And, and there were some I incidents where uh, solvents uh, exploded. Um, you, you talk about uh, um, incidents like that. I mean, you know, there are a lot of industries that it's a given a certain number of people are going to die. And, and that was never accepted out of Rocky Flats that a certain, the, the, the people that got hurt out there didn't have anything to do in general with it being Rocky Flats. Mm -hmm. They had to do with running out in the middle of the road and getting run over, uh, n n electrical boxes that, that, that could happen in any kind of industry. Um, Tragic one was a fellow that was jogging on the, on the. I shouldn't have shouldn't have said what I just said. Running out in the middle of the road, it it didn't happen that way. But there was a, a a runner going down the access road that wanted to turn around and come back, and without looking back, he and he got run over when he made the U-turn to come back to the plant, and it was a, a tragic thing, but. But, but he was killed. Uh, and, and there are incidents like that, but as far as, and, and people have been hurt. People have gotten um, uh, exposed to, to um, plutonium, to uh, beryllium, to other materials. Um, but but I, think that, I think that the safety program then was as strong as they knew how to make it. And you can never factor out human error, no matter what you do. Um, you, you were never exposed to any solvents or uh, um, or I was exposed to beryllium. Oh, um, <clears throat> I spent a lot of time in the beryllium shop, and they had hoods over the beryllium work that, that uh, had an updraft, so the material but I know that I was exposed to beryllium, but I'm in the beryllium program and I show no uh, problem with the beryllium. I know I've been exposed to beryllium in, in the welding of it and all of that, but, but I'm tested regularly and I show no um, effect mm -hmm. of the exposure to beryllium. In fact, most people don't, uh, but it turns out that everybody's different and, and a little bit of uh, beryllium will affect some people just dramatically, and other people not at all. And and so that that's one probably one of the standards that um, we didn't know, or they didn't know, or whoever it is. Um, I think there are other uh, there are solvents um, that some people would be um, sensitive to, and other well. A, a good example is I'm allergic to cats. Well, I, I suspect that 90% of the population isn't allergic to cats. And, and, and so that's just kind of an example of what I'm allergic to and what other people might uh, find that they couldn't fight beryllium. Asbestos is an, another one that, that is, is a bad actor in, in some people. Um, but but I, th I think that I think that the companies tried to be very safe. I'm going to just turn on these lights while I'm asking this question. How did you feel about um, the way the safety issues were portrayed in the media? Well, I used to have some, uh, down on the base, okay. I used to have some fun back in the, in the, uh, Oh, let's see, probably in the um, 
70s. I was, the department I was working in was a, um, had not only classification, but it had PR and those kinds of things too. And so it was kind of, it was kind of fun because when, when the boss was gone, I would get to uh, talk to the visiting uh, journalism students. And University of Wyoming sent people down and others did because it was considered, well, if you can, if, if you can be a reporter, a uh, journalist out at Rocky Flats on their staff, you can do anything because that's, that's a tough nut to crack and work out there. So I would get to talk to them and one thing I told them is that the problem I have with journalists is that they've got a degree in journalism. I said, show me journalists and journalism students that have physics and chemistry and maybe a little biology and you could become a lot more believable to me because the, the, the attempt is that I'm a journalist, I'm a smart guy, I can understand this. No, you can't. And I still believe that the journalism schools are badly failing their students in that they don't prepare them, especially for the scientific um, community. And so I would sit in meetings back in, uh, back in the 70s and listen to people talk and read about it in the paper and wonder if we've been at the same meeting. And so I've, I've got probably a, a uh, often unfair view of, of uh, journalists and, and I, never, I never felt that they went out of their way to check facts very well. I, I always got the feeling, and this isn't all of them, don't get me wrong, there are good journalists out there. But I, but I always felt that um, a, lot, a lot of what, it, well, I knew that a lot of what was reported was in error. And, but we were told, leave it alone, don't write letters to the editor and, and, and all of that, attacking that, because you, know, you don't want to get into some kind of a shouting contest with this, so, so leave it alone. But I, I think that, um, there's a lot of times been a, somebody senses a story and it, it just doesn't come out correctly. Um, the, the, the article in the paper that talked about the Chernobyl thing, was that a year ago, roughly? They compared a nuclear reactor to Rocky Flats. It, that's no comparison. That's, a, that's apples and oranges. That isn't even apples and oranges. That's rocks and oranges. Uh, terrible comparison. I mean, come on. Uh, that, that was ridiculous. And, but yet, uh, they'd spent some time in Russia and, and for something, you probably remember the article, I don't, maybe you don't, but it was, it was, I think it was in the Post. And uh, uh, Chernobyl and uh, Rocky Flats are supposed to, the, the only way that they're, that, that, that they would be related at all is they both had radioactive materials. Mm -hmm. uh, the materials that we have out there, the plutonium-239, um, is actually uh, uh, not a material you'd want to sleep with or anything like that. But compared to reactor products, like the, like the products that came out of Chernobyl, I mean, they're almost benign compared to what the reactor products are. Those things are nasty. Mm -hmm. And plutonium-239, is an alpha emitter. You don't want to eat it, you don't want to drink it, or you don't want to breathe it. But uh, um, it, it's, not a, it, it's not a terrible actor like those that give off a lot of gamma radiation that, that's gonna do really bad things to you. So I, I, I don't think that, I don't think that, that in, in general, I, I don't think that they're prepared, a lot of the journalists are prepared to report on a lot of the things like that. Um, why don't you 
would you tell me, um, <clears throat> so you were around for the 69 fire, right? Oh, yes. And why don't you tell me your memories of that? Well, it was Mother's Day in 69, and um, I, was <clears throat> I was a product engineer and uh, started to hear bad things. And so uh, that was a Sunday. And so I went out to work Monday, and it was devastating. It was, it was uh, uh, some material that had, some fines, some turnings that had been in, um, been in a can. Then, and plutonium will spontaneously, uh, you know, it's very pyrophoric. And so it got burning, and evidently there was a problem with the sensor that it was sitting on and didn't report back that it was getting hot and before very long. Um, the whole thing really, really got out of hand, and they had a big fire in there. And the one of the strange things, or one of the um, things that worked against us was the fact that people had been very concerned about exposure to nuclear materials, so they'd gone in to this manufacturing building and they'd put up uh, shields that would prevent people from getting radiation irradiated from the material. Well, what do you suppose one of the big contributors to the fire was? The material that they used that was a safety issue. They said, boy, this is going to make it a lot better because people won't get exposed and all that. And so this is going to make it better and all of that. And it worked terribly against against the firemen. It was very flammable. Very, yeah, it, 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 it wasn't very flammable, but once it's, it, it's sort of like a newspaper, packed newspaper. You know, it doesn't just, it, it sits there and, and, and doesn't flame, but it burns. And it, and it uh, uh, when you got it going, the, the, the materials, they got going. And that contributed to the um, to the to the loading, the material, uh, the fuel uh, loading, tremendously. And it was a big fire. It it was at one time they said the costliest fire in American industry, but it wasn't the costliest fire. It was the costliest um, in in that it was a huge fire. It was a big fire, but it was the fact that it was radioactive material and people had to go in there and clean it up. So you talk about going in there and having to wipe it down and clean it up and all. That's where the cost went, was into doing all those kinds of things, rather than consuming um, materials. And, and, and one of the, the kind of interesting things was that, you know, we had an inventory of the material that was in the building and we had more when we got done cleaning it up. And that's because um, when you have a manufacturing process where you're machining nuclear materials, uh, it's some of the materials get, uh, as they're machined, little flakes of material come off if you've ever been in a machine shop. Mm -hmm. And when you get done with the machining process, in a regular machine shop, you look on the floor and there's all these little tiny specks of turning. Well, those fell in the bottom of the lathes, and the lathes were in glove boxes. And so when those have accumulated over several years, you got quite a bit of material down there. And so that's material that you knew you were going to lose, but you were going to recover when the building's torn down or whenever you do cleanup or whatever. And so uh, there was quite a bit of material that was recovered. Well, that's an unfortunate way to have to recover it. but. Um, but that was kind of interesting that they came up with uh, with a lot of this material and, and, and you know well why didn't you find it well it's no different to, it's no different from any other uh, machining manufacturing uh, foundry job that some of that material sticks to stuff and all of that 
and eventually if if things go right you'll find it and so that was uh, um, that was what happened there but anyway then the next day we got out there and boy this silly fire and, and everybody was extremely upset as you might as you might guess and and top management had just spent 24 hours out there and the fire department had spent a lot of time out there and um, getting making sure the fire was out and uh, and of course investigators came to look at what all was going on and and uh, uh, it, it truly was a mess and I've, there there are pictures and you uh, you can get them and, and in fact they ought to be in the collection uh, there are pictures of the burned uh, materials inside the 776 building uh, it was interesting that <clears throat> that they were about ready to phase that building out <clears throat> with the new 707 building and uh, it opened in, in 1970, I believe. But the, the fire was in May of 69, and there was a manufacturing area in that building that had been walled off that was making parts in August of 69. So June, July, in three months, they'd gone in there and taking enough material out and putting enough lathes in to one area. I mean, the, the, the effort on uh, the fire cleanup was nothing short of incredible. But it was, you, you know, you talk about people sitting around and just, you go out on Monday, I remember sitting there and your heart's almost in your, you just, you can't believe that and, you, and you're concerned about whether people are going to get hurt when they're out there cleaning it up. And, and so I, I suspect that the people that, wasn't actually, that weren't actually working on the fire probably didn't do much but just kind of reflect for the next couple of days. I know I, I, a lot of the guys I worked with um, were on the cleanup detail. A lot of the engineers that I was working with were uh, suited up and put in uh, supplied air suits and went in and did a lot of the cleanup. So it was scary. Yeah. Um, well, what about the FBI raid? Oh, yeah, the FBI raid. The FBI raid, the famous 1989 raid. The, um, there were allegations that um, there was incineration, illegal incineration, and I think the other one was that there was illegal dumping of material into uh, probably Walnut Creek, one of the creeks out there. Um, and so that, that morning the uh, agents had come in and uh, were starting to confiscate just about anything that they could. They would, <clears throat> they'd go into an office of somebody they thought was, could have been involved and said, turn on your computer and get out. So they would download computer files, open your safe and get out. And they would, and it turns out that <clears throat> the, the original allegations were proven to be false. The, the allegation on the illegal burning, the, the furnace that was alleged to have been the one that was, was being rebricked. So it wasn't, <clears throat> it wasn't in operation. What, what happened on the furnace was that the, the um, temperature differential was made on a very cold day. So with it being cold outside and room temperature air coming out the stack, there was a great temperature differential. And so that was interesting. And, you know, everybody and his brother monitors the water that's coming out of Rocky Flats. And so there was, a, there was no 
anomaly there. And so the, it was interesting. One of the agents that came in, and I got involved immediately because the FBI, if anything, is afraid of classified information. They just, so we checked everything they took. We reviewed it for classification. And even the classified documents we reviewed and to make sure that they really were classified. So it was about two o'clock that first afternoon that I was in the in, in 111 building uh, auditorium, standing just out of the auditorium, and one of the agents came to me. And we were talking, and he said, we made a big mistake. But that, that never got, that never went any further than that. And I, I, th I think I know the name of the guy. I would never say what his name was, but he said, we made a big mistake. Um, there's nothing here. Uh, some, some, there were some anomalies uh, in, in some areas, and I think there was an $18 million fine for Rockwell, as I recall, and then Rockwell, uh, I don't know if the appeals and everything are totally done on that yet or not, but, but the original allegations certainly were shown to be not substantiated. Um, but for the next several weeks while they were out there collecting information, we were, I had a crew of people up there in the, in the auditorium and we were reviewing everything that they, uh, that they were collecting and then, uh, um, but it was, it was interesting. Um, how did you feel about when production stopped? Well, of course, immediate, uh, at first we thought that it would, would start again. And um, then it didn't and didn't, and then they said it's not going to. I, um, I knew that production couldn't just stop. If, if there was no production out there, there had to be production somewhere. Because uh, it, it's, not like, uh, it's not like you can guarantee that you have um, something that'll work forever. Um, you know, in environment, various kinds of things can, uh, and, and aging. Uh, if 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 you've got a, if you've got an arsenal, that may or may not work, you may have a paper tiger. And and so, I, I thought and still think that Rocky Flats should have been left basically intact. Did you? Th I mean, did how did? What about? Um feeling that people have that it shouldn't be so close to a major metropolitan area. In the, pardon? In the, that, that, it shouldn't, that if there is a production facility, it shouldn't be in such a major metropolitan area. Well, yeah, you know, there's, and, and I, think, I think that's a perception by, um, by some that um, there's the group that thinks there's no danger out there, and there is. There's a group that thinks that, that the world's coming to an end, and it's not. And, and somewhere in between, pro probably if, if uh, y you were citing a place now, you wouldn't pick that. But, if you're, but Denver in 1950 was a fairly small city. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of acreage out here that uh, was, y y there, there, there was the requirements for building a plant like Rocky Flats were that it had to be west of the Mississippi. It had to have reasonably good air and rail, um, dry climate, some of those kinds of things. And so uh, I don't remember. There were several sites that, that they came up with, and I could look up, but don't remember what. There were like five, and they picked Rocky Flats. Probably the, probably the transportation for Rocky Flats with roads, rails, and air, I suspect was probably as good as any they could find. And uh, um, the, the, the cost of moving Rocky Flats or moving the, the activities to other places is astronomical. I mean, we're not talking about millions of dollars. We're talking about billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to do all of this. 
and if you know the 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 people who have done the the various um, uh, studies of what winds would do to if if you have a fire and what would happen um, you, know, you know basically the material really isn't going anywhere to 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 affect people um, the amount of the amount of of radiation that a worker out get, gets out there is small compared to what an airline pilot gets um, and and so and and the material is not the reactor product you know if you if you've got reactor products you've got to do some things to ensure that that the materials aren't going to get loose but uh, while the material is not um, as dangerous as and you know it's not without some peril I don't get me wrong but it's not a kind of material that that is um, um, going to be a disaster um, so I think uh, I think probably the plant should be left where it is for um, you know they, they did some studies and you know the the cancer deaths uh, from Rocky Flats being out there, you're going to count have one one death in a billion, and, and don't quote me on that, but in some large number of people. And the only reason that it came up with a number like that is because there's not zero risk. You, you can't you can't say it's zero. And so some of those numbers really are pretty meaningless. Um, but sure, they wouldn't build it there now if they were starting from zero. But but I think that I think that the billions they are gonna spend on it to build a facility somewhere else, I think that's just silly. Because not only do you have building the facility for billions of dollars, the people don't know anything about it. You know, they gotta re retool, they gotta train all the people. It's not tri a, a lot of the work we did out there was not totally science. There were guys out there that were real arty and they could they could do stuff that you just wouldn't believe. And it had to do with almost how they held their mouth and you know, just crazy kinds of kinds of things like that. But just a a, a, a feeling of, of this isn't quite right. I'm going to change these parameters just a little, especially in the development. Mm -hmm. you, in, in production, you can't do that. Right. But in the development, we're going to change this, tweak this just a little bit. And uh, these guys are geniuses. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just good. They're really good. So you're going to have to rebuild that all over again. you gotta, you got to rebuild that. And, you know, with all the uh, restrictions and state health departments and EPAs and, and watchdog groups and, and, you know, if you don't dot an I in an environmental impact statement, they send it back and those kinds of things. And we've, we've really, you've got to operate separately, but sometimes it's just, we've just been silly on some of the requirements we put. <coughs> So, um, how do you feel about the protests? Oh, I th I think that I think that that's one of the things that uh, makes us great. Um, I don't have any problem with the protesters. I think that I think that some of them were misguided, but they think that I'm misguided, and I think that if you if if people don't have the right to do that, we're in trouble. So. Sure, we watched them, and, and uh, I, I didn't ever go out in the line and talk to them, but uh, a lot of guys did, and, and most of them are good folks. You know, they, uh, you got some radicals out there. We got some, probably some radicals inside, and you hope that the radicals don't, don't butt heads. But uh, so the, the one that they were, tried to circle the plant, that was pretty impressive. They, they didn't make it, but... They they had some gaps there, but but that was 
that was pretty impressive. And um, um, there were there were some that were trying to trying to get arrested and some of those kinds of things, but uh, the protests were they're okay. Did you participate in any of the pro nuclear? Rallies? No, I didn't. Um, okay. Um, let me ask you some wrap-up questions, and then I might go back and ask you some. Well, actually, I'll, we have this list of questions about the buildings because we um, okay. are trying to document them for the state historical fund. So okay. um, we have about we have about a half hour, so we can probably. And I, I okay. want to make sure I get to sort of just talking about broader stuff about, your okay. about the plant. Um, <clears throat> just tell me what a typical day was like to, to in those buildings, and what it was like to work there, and um, what involved getting into the building, getting out the different clothing you had to wear and that sort of thing. And, and it may have, I don't know if it was different when you became a classifier as opposed to when you were in, in the shops, but. Well, in a lot, most of the work I did was in <clears throat> either um, 76, 77, they call them 776, 777, and um, um, 444, 444 building. I did most of my work in those two buildings. <clears throat> as a, as an engineer, um, you get to work and, and usually let, if you were working with some of the machinists and inspectors, <clears throat> you kind of let them get their, they changed out into white coveralls. Mm -hmm. And you'd probably show up maybe 30 minutes after they got to to, to work and had, you'd had your coffee and maybe they had too and, and um, start with um, chasing whatever parts you were having, making sure that everything was going smoothly if, 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 if your part was going to inspection. You just wanted to make, the guys were pretty good, but you just wanted to make sure that, that everything was happening as needed because uh, you, pro you might have an, in uh, an assembly the next week, and so you just wanted to make sure you were ready for it. But they had smocks uh, for the engineers, and you put a smock on, and then you had to put uh, booties to cover your shoes. They were just a little slip-on with a rubber band. So you didn't change uh, so your, your didn't, didn't Unless you were going to be back there and, and get more involved, uh, we didn't change out. Once in a while, if you were, um, you, you would change into coveralls just to make sure. Um, and you'd be, you'd be a little careful. You didn't want to just lean up against everything and, because once in a while there'd be a little residual radiation which you didn't, you didn't want to come out and have, when you monitored out, have a radiation monitor there and say, oh, we're going to have to take your shirt or your coat or your trousers or whatever, and then they'd send it through the laundry, and when you got it back, it was worthless, because the, the laundry wasn't prepared to handle nice clothes, it was prepared to handle coveralls. Mm -hmm. So, but you got to where you were pretty careful about what you leaned up against and what you sat on. You, generally, the, the best way to, to be back there observing was to be standing with your hands behind you. And that was a pretty good way to, to, uh, to be in the building. Um, and every time you went out, you, you put the, the booty covers in when you went in. When, every time you went out, then you had to monitor out mm -hmm. and make sure that you weren't, didn't have any contamination on your clothes or on your booties. And once in a great while, probably, Oh, a half a dozen times, and I did it for eight years. Half a dozen times, you found you had a booty that had maybe a little bit of a, um, a shoe cover that had a little bit of radiation, and so you'd put it in the what? There were two bins: one that that they were cold, and one that they were hot. And hot meant it didn't have anywhere from a lot on it to a little. But uh, uh, you'd get rid of them, and then when you go back in, then you'd. You'd have to put the booties on every time that you went back in, but I didn't. I didn't dress out very often. And if if you um, they detected radiation on your clothing, did a big alarm go off? Or there was uh, there 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 were uh, 
self-monitoring instruments. And so you'd, it was a, you'd step into, um, there, there was a place to put your foot. You'd step into there with both feet, and then they had a probe, and you'd run it over your, over, you'd, first you'd run it over your, your uh, um, mask, and uh, your, and then after that, you'd run it over your sleeves and make just make sure you didn't have it. At the end, <coughs> at the end of the day, then there was there were radiation monitors there that monitored monitored you out. So when you walked out, and they had the they they, they, they had the they had the the uh, equipment there to 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 monitor you out, and, and so. You know, if if you if you carry that stuff into the office or in your car, you got a real mess. So, yeah. but but that was typically the way the the way I did it. Every day I was back there, and then when you when you went to 444 building, they they machined some uh, uranium over there and various other materials and beryllium. Mm -hmm. And so when you went into the beryllium shop, there was another. Um, different color of smock mm -hmm. and uh, respirator that you would wear and um, and booties they were blue as I recall when you went in there and so you'd, you'd go in there and then but but there was no way to monitor out you just you always put the smock on you always had the shoe covers on and uh, then they had hats uh, that you could, that you could put on, but then when you went out, you you just put everything in a used um, hamper, um, and as I said, there was not a monitor there to be able to tell whether you had beryllium or not. Um, if you were to take a, a blueprint of the buildings as they were built, and then compare it to what they were like when production stopped. Were the buildings, were there changes that the blueprints didn't reflect in yeah. the buildings? Yes. And these were to make processes better? Or yeah, they did that. They never, for some reason, we never were able to have modified totally up to date. It just never happened. The asphalts. That, yeah, it just, yeah, they were different. And, and, that's, and that's bad. And what, what sort of changes were made? And, and I guess why weren't you able to? Were there just so many that they could? Change? Well, there were a lot of changes, and and they were <clears throat> there were engineering drawings that did it. I mean, you you didn't make this change without author, authorization of the drawing, but sometimes that never got incorporated into the actual building plan. Mm -hmm. You know, if 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 you dig through the file, oh yes, we changed this stairway or we did that or we did that it was somewhere but it, but if you just pulled the blueprint it wouldn't necessarily be there hmm. that where, where that's particularly bad is if you have a an incident over there and the lights are out and they're looking okay we, we can get into this this way and and so <clears throat> we were we as a plant were not good at making sure that uh, on the as built so what sort of what's like the most memorable change to the building that and you know, maybe were, were the oh. workers having put on this will work better this way or how did these things happen? Workers had a lot of input as to far as okay this process would be easier. Um, you, you find out Dow Chemical knew very well and Rockwell knew well that that you know these these old machinists there that had a high school education and didn't have a PhD or a master's or anything like that, if they could make you or break you. Mm -hmm. And so you, you needed to keep them on your side because they were the guys that actually did the work. And I, you know, there, there, was, a, there was a manager out there as an, as an example, Whitey Evans. Um, he'd take his whole crew of machinists out for, uh, I don't know, for lunch or dinner about 
once a year. Take all of them out for dinner. And uh, just to show that he appreciated them. Because these guys, a lot of these guys that didn't have a lot of the formal education were geniuses. I mean, they, uh, they could do things with a, with a lathe that just was incredible, and, and with a, or with a welder or various kinds of things. They were innovative guys, and uh, um, so you listen to what they said. You know, if they said, we need to modify this equipment to do this, uh, you listen to them. And, and, and a lot of the changes were put in by by the hourly workers, were, were suggested by, uh, of course, the, the engineering folks would come in and draw it up and all that if it was deemed to be a good idea. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, and, and a lot of the changes came out of the technical folks too. So, uh, and, and I suspect probably more of them came out of there, but a lot of, a lot of the good ideas came out of the hourly workforce. Oh, uh, a good example would, would be uh, the, the ease of, if, if there's an operation that's, um, that's awkward, um, and I think of a couple of them, we, if we did this, it would smooth it up so that this process could move much more easily and with less uh, um, uh, problem than the way we're doing it now. And, and I know that happened. I've seen that happen back in, there were processes that were changed back in, in uh, one of the buildings I was working in, in 77 building, that, that, the, that the guys, the, the techs and the machinists had suggested a couple of things. Uh, you're working in, a, in an area of a downdraft room. That's where you um, have um, bare plutonium, a guy's handling bare plutonium, but with gloves on, rubber gloves on, uh, it would be handier to have a certain piece of equipment here rather than above or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but, but there were a lot of um, things that were, um, that the operation just went smoothly because of, a, a, and, and again, a lot of the modifications weren't made for that reason at all. A lot of the modifications were made because of new requirements. Okay, we're building this thing and it's different from what it used to be and so we've got to have a modification here to accommodate that. And I suspect that most of the changes were that kind of things. The, the world's changing. Uh, this doesn't work for very well for what we're doing now and so uh, we're going to make this change. And, and I really think that most of them were that kind of change rather than, rather than the other, but, but we did both. Okay, um, let me ask a few wrap up questions. Okay. Getting, getting up to two hours. Um, how did you feel about working in a plant that produced a key part of nuclear weapons and did your view of that change over time? No, I felt, I felt fine about that. I think, um, I guess with some of us old I don't, I don't know if I'm a redneck. I don't think I am. Maybe I am, but I, I think that um, I think that it's unfortunate that you have to have a if you blow us up, we're going to blow you up too. But, but I think that prevented a lot of the uh, possibilities of war. I, I don't have any doubt but what it uh, at one time, if the Russians thought they could get away with coming in and taking us over, I think they'd have done it in a, in a heartbeat. And so I think that um, I think that it was important to have the nuclear deterrent. And I never had any problem, and still don't, with the with the deterrent. Um, what was the best things about working? Pay was good. Challenges were were wonderful challenges. Uh, we were doing things out there that that just uh, um, some of the guys were doing stuff that we we had probably the greatest 
assembly of welding experts that the world's ever known, literally. We, I mean, we, we had guys that, that were geniuses in, in welding, and not all of them were degreed either. Uh, but guys that could do the setup and guys that could do the welding and guys, the theory guys and all of that. Um, but it was, and it was a, it was a can-do place. You know, we aren't going to sit around and mope about something that we can't do because we can do anything. And I think, I think that was important as far as I'm concerned. Um, that, and, and I suspect that on a challenge of, uh, on, a, on a scale of wages to, to challenges, you know, wages hardly ever come out first, and I don't think they did with me. <clears throat> but it was a place that we were, we were played, paid better than, <clears throat> than most people in the Denver area. But the challenges were incredible. The, and the equipment was great. You know, you were, you were, you were working with some of the best equipment that there was, and <clears throat> you were working with, and the other thing is you were working with, with great people, with really competent folks. And so, but somewhere in there, uh, we, were, we, were, we were paid better than most people in the Denver area. <clears throat> well, Probably when, when for me the most difficult thing in working there was the the hours that you'd be out there on a project that you know you might work. Uh, I had weeks that I worked 120 to 130 hours in a week, and and even though the work is challenging and interesting, that gets old fairly fast yeah. and and for me because um, as far as the plant and everything and working out there and driving out there there was nothing difficult about that uh, the parking if you work for some companies downtown you might walk three or four blocks shoot I was usually parked within less than a quarter of a block of where I went into the building um, Sometimes the <clears throat> security was kind of a pain, but, but not in general. Um, it was a thing that you knew you had to have and go through. It was, uh, um, y you were always going the right direction as far as traffic. Everybody's coming into the city and you were going out of the city. Hmm. So you hardly ever had a traffic problem. Um, the, uh, the management, certainly in the early days and up until, uh, and, and I can't talk recently because I'm working for DOE and I don't know the management in Kaiser Hill, but <clears throat> the management with Dow and Rockwell, you know, I had no problem with walking into the plant manager's office and talking to him. And, and they'd talk to me. I mean, they didn't... Um, the, 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 they didn't hold you at arm's length at all, mm -hmm. and that was under both uh, Dow and Rockwell. I didn't, uh, I didn't know the E G and G people that well, and I was getting ready to go to work for for uh, D O E anyway. So, um. <laughs> totally made me forget my question. Um. Oh yeah, I, I, one thing I forgot to ask you earlier is, how do you feel about the cleanup? I mean, do you feel that it can be cleaned up? Can, should, will be cleaned up? Well, <clears throat> I, I think it will be cleaned up. It's not going to be pristine. Uh, pristine's expensive. Yeah. Um, I think that, I think that I'd feel um, safe hiking out there any time, um, and I think that um, I think that anybody that decides to use it as a um, um, recreation area, I don't think there's going to be any um, any kind of a 
uh, health issue with any of them. The, the only thing I, I wonder about is that there's, uh, if, if you have a 50 year rain or something like that, and you've covered it over and capped it, I, I don't know exactly what the water flow will be. Um, I don't think the materials, um, I, I don't know where the materials would go. I think that if they end up in the bottom of a reservoir, that's probably not a health issue, but it, it's one of those things you just kind of wonder about whether you, whether you really want it or not. Um, Will you miss um, having things to classify? Oh, <laughs> when it's all over? <laughs> it, yeah, probably. Although we're we're gonna, you know, it's time for it's time for Betty and me to retire, and I'll 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 see it through till till we till closure. Probably I'm gonna be there pretty much till till it's over. But um, yeah, you know, and and I wouldn't if if there are some areas in which I can do a little bit of work on it up into the, for in the next few years, some part-time stuff. I'd be interested in doing that. But. We will have to give you newspapers to, uh, yeah. to classify every morning. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's sad seeing the old, the old plant uh, taken down. Yeah. You know, it, uh, some, several, several of the buildings I've worked in are no longer there. Um, but it's, uh, I think the deer are going to enjoy the place, and they already do. I, I found, I was going out, a couple of years ago, I was going out to my car. I parked right beside a building, and I, it was probably about 30 minutes after. I go in kind of late, and I try to work kind of late both, but there was a fawn right beside my car. And, so I didn't know what to do about it. I knew I shouldn't touch it or anything like that. So I went in and called some people. And they said, well, just try to step over it and get in your car. And its mama will be there before too long. But it's, there's, there's some pretty deer out there, and there's some nice rattlesnakes, and there's some prebles mice, and there's some, some um, raptors, and uh, all kinds of uh, interesting birds and and plant growth and 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 I I think it's a treasure actually I think it's a diamond um, to be able to preserve um, ten ten square miles roughly uh, for that's not going to be developed I, I think that's great and and. I, th I think it's safe. I think as they let people hike out there and all of that, I think that uh, I think they're perfectly safe in in doing that. Okay. Well, um, anything else to add? No, I uh, I think your your idea of the uh, trying to find some of the people that can talk a little bit about legacy I think are good and I think I think people need to know that basically we were good guys out there and we weren't trying to we weren't trying to mess anything up we weren't we're not warmongers uh, at, at all but I think that I think that you'll find out that most of the people that worked out there thought it was at, at least a, a, a good place to work and at least a necessary evil if you want to call it an evil. Um, it's one of those things that uh, um, anything like an atomic bomb or a hydrogen bomb, uh, if the first guy doesn't invent it, somebody else is pretty close behind. Mm -hmm. There are almost no discoveries, scientific discoveries, that somebody else isn't right, right behind them. And so I think it's, I think it's good that you know, with the Manhattan Project and and Los Alamos and and all of that, I think it's good that the that the U.S. actually was uh, was first in kind of getting there. Um, and it's it's you know annihilation for the enemy and annihilation for you isn't the kind of 
situation that you'd like to be in. But but I, but I but there was some of that, and uh, I think it worked. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Great interview, and uh, I am going to take now. Thank you. Okay.